Hello, and welcome to the Handheld Zero podcast, the show where a uh, regular guy just goes on a handheld gaming ride. That's me. My name is Nate, uh, also known as Conception2, if you follow me on Twitch. Uh, I'm going to be your host and aforementioned regular guy for the show. Um, it's exciting. This is our first real episode. Um, I definitely suggest you kind of go back and watch, slash listen to our episode zero, as I'm calling it, just to kind of... Um, get a sense of what the show is, get a sense of the goals and the inspiration behind the show. It gives you a little bit more context as well. Um, But this is going to be the first official episode with a specific subject and things like that. Um, And you might be wondering, what is that subject? So as uh, mentioned in the episode zero, every week or every episode, I should say, because it might be every couple weeks, we are going to be focusing on a, one particular handheld game. So a handheld game obviously being defined as a game that you can play on a handheld device. So that includes your old Game Boys, that includes your Switch, that includes your phone, that includes some more abstract things like PSPs or you know Sega Game Gear or something like that. Uh, N-Gage, you guys remember N-Gage? Um, things like that. So anything that is played on a handheld device, so not on a console. Um, This week we focused on a game from the Game Boy Advanced, uh, or Game Boy Advance. I don't believe there's a D at the end, but I'll have to check that. Don't think there is. Anyway, um, yes, so it's going to be a game for the Game Boy Advance. It is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. All right. Now, before, before we even, before we even get into anything, before we even get into anything about the game, about why this game, before we even touch upon anything, I have a massive disclaimer. Kind of weird to have a massive disclaimer in the first episode, but here we go. Here's my disclaimer. Featuring this game on this show is in no way, absolutely no way, an endorsement of J.K. Rowling. I personally condemn J.K. Rowling for her statements on uh, the trans community. Trans women are women, trans men are men, trans non-binary folk are non-binary folk. Turf and trans exclusionary bullshit is not tolerated in my community and any community that I'm a part of. I do not stand for it at all. Um, If you are listening and you're watching and this applies to you, please know that this is always going to be a safe place for you to be yourself. All right. Don't feel like this is an endorsement of her. It absolutely is not. Uh, With that being said, we are just going to talk, obviously, about the game and the game components itself, not necessarily the social component behind, you know, the author of the story that this game is based on. But I just want to make it clear that I have I, I do not support her in any way. Absolutely not. Um, So let's start with a little context, right? Why did I start with a third game in a series? Why did I, why this game? Why the Game Boy Advance? There's other versions of uh, Prisoner of Azkaban even that we could could talk about. There's a few reasons. Um, To give a little context, um, what I've been doing on my free time on my Twitch channel and streaming it live on most days that I haven't been working and things like that, um, I've been speedrunning video games. If you're not familiar, speedrunning video games is where you're just trying to get from point A to point B in some sort of category specific rules as fast as you can. So, two games that I have been speedrunning regularly, and one of which I even have a world record and not to brag, um, are Harry Potter and the Prisoner of, uh, sorry, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone for Game Boy Color, and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets for Game Boy Color. Philosopher's Stone is the one I have the world record in. Um, I've been playing those two games a ton. um, And what makes those two versions special is, and we're going to delve into this a little bit with Harry Potter 3 as well, is that those two games are turn-based RPGs, where every other Harry Potter game that is in that vein is a different form of some sort. They're a puzzle game, a 3D action platformer kind of game. They're all very different. So the re- what drew me to this was the RPG elements. So I've been playing these two games. They have the RPG elements. And as we're going to talk a little bit more about shortly, Harry Potter 3 has these same RPG elements. So despite our first episode being uh, a third in the series, I've played one and two extensively, extensively. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about this third one, which I've just gotten. I've ne- I didn't play this one as a kid or anything like this. I just played it for the first time. I'm just getting ready to start learning how to speed run it even. And uh, I just wanted to delve into it as it was fresh on my mind. Um, 
all of these Harry Potter RPG games were developed by the same developer as well. So there is kind of a common through line. Uh, that's why I kind of wanted to to learn all three of the games in the series. Unfortunately, it doesn't go past Prisoner of Azkaban uh, with that through line. But yeah, just that just gives a little contents about why this one. All right, so the second, well, for, second segment, but first official segment is going to be called Nateopedia. All right, this is uh, just to give context. I won't say <laughs> what it does every time, but since it's the first episode, just to kind of give you a little bit more about what's going on. Nateopedia is going to feature a summary of the story, summary of the gameplay, summary of the history and development and production and release of the game, just to kind of give you uh, the general scope of everything. So Nateopedia. So the story, if you're not familiar, features Harry Potter, age 13, getting ready to be in his third year of wizarding school at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uh, the game, if you're familiar with the story before, the game does not start with you know all the stuff the beginning at home. He, it starts way in, into, uh, in, not way into his journey, but no home part uh, at all. Um, he starts in the Leaky Cauldron. He um, he hears these rumblings of a mass murderer named Sirius Black who has just re recently escaped Azkaban, which is the wizard prison, naturally. Um, he's also hearing rumblings that this is somehow connected to him. He learns uh, through uh, friends and, and you know surrogate family of sorts that Sirius Black is out to find Harry specifically uh, and, and try to kill him. So he goes into... Uh, his third year at school with this kind of you know weight on his shoulders that somebody is looking for him but it's not really new for harry because he's already constantly being afraid of death as everyone's already you know trying to get at him mostly voldemort but you know you know there's there's bad people in the school too that uh that don't like him so much anyways so he get, he makes uh his journey towards the school on the hogwarts express the train that takes him from london to the school uh where he encounters dementors for the first time um, so worst part about Azkaban, the Dementors are everywhere, and they uh, they are basically the the prison guards, but they're uh, some kind of creature that sucks the soul and happiness out of you. It's kind of worse than dying; it just takes your soul. Um, th this obviously disturbs Harry as somebody who's faced a lot of tremendous, you know, guilt and um, and death in his lifetime. So the joy uh, that he does cling on to, obviously, is very powerful. Um, they also run into their new defense against a dark arts teacher named Lupin, who, despite you know the first two, which are obviously uh, one try in the year one, his defense against the dark arts teacher tries to kill him because he's half Voldemort. In year two, uh, technically also tries to kill him if you think about it. Tries to erase his memory because he's a complete narcissist. Uh, but year three, they finally got it right—a good teacher that supports the students and everything like that. Um, Lupin helps Harry get through uh, the mentors and feeling better. Um, cut to uh, Hogwarts. We have arrived. Year three. We start going through our different classes. A new one is uh, Care of Magical Creatures, which is taught by Hagrid. So we get to see some unique creatures, namely a hippogriff, which is kind of like a bird. It's like a bird, horse, f flying... It's, it's hard to describe. It's like a bird horse, I would say. It's a bird horse. We're just going to say bird horse. So bird horse. Um, obviously uh, gets along famously with Harry, attacks uh, Draco during class. Draco, being an absolute Karen, says, I'm going to tell my dad about this. You'll hear from my father, blah, blah, blah. So that, that's going on. Um, in the meantime, Harry's just going about his normal life. He's got his classes. He's got, you know, he's got things going on. Uh, you would think Quidditch, like in the books and the uh, movies, but we don't see that as much. Um, Sirius Black makes an apparent sighting in the castle. Um, there's uh, the f portrait of the fat lady is attacked. There is uh, the potential that Sirius Black is nearby. Uh, we find out very shortly that he is, in fact, nearby um, in taking the form of a black dog. Um, we go through this. Uh, we do, in fact, hear from Draco's father and their lawyer who have sentenced Buckbeak to, Buckbeak to death for attacking Draco, when in reality Draco was the, the absolute moron who instigated. And uh, we go through the story, um, obviously on the search for 
uh, Sirius Black as well. Uh, Ron gets kind of attacked by this black dog and dragged underneath the Whomping Willow, which is a tree that attacks you. I don't know why you'd have that on a school, but it's a tree that attacks you. Um, that leads uh, to a uh, building called the Shrieking Shack. It is with there that we finally meet Sirius Black face to face. He confronts Harry saying, no, I don't want to kill you. I'm actually, I was actually your, you know, the best friend to your parents. And then this guy killed you. And he points to a rat that Ron has in his lap. And the rat is somebody also in disguise named Peter Pettigrew, who was like the servant of Lord Voldemort and the real person that was responsible for the death of Harry's parents in terms of like ratting them out and selling out where they were. Um, so they were searching out Peter Pettigrew who did this. Um, Lupin was obviously in on this as well as somebody who was friends with, um, with uh, Sirius. He did believe that Sirius was guilty at the start of the book, learned through the course of the events of the book and the story that Sirius was in fact not guilty. So we get through that. Uh, we get outside of the, of the uh, we capture Peter, we get outside of the Whomping Willow, but unfortunately it's a full moon and spoiler alert, through the rest of the story, Lupin is actually a werewolf, so we can't fully get it right. Full moon, Lupin didn't take his potion, I guess that's something that like keeps him under control, I don't really know, um, and he turns into a werewolf, um, the werewolf uh, we defeat, uh, hold off by using um, the uh, hippogriff named Buckbeak later on. But uh, we get there, and because of that, the Dementors are able to locate Sirius and capture him. Um, we are uh, seeing that, and we kind of get stuck in this process that, hey, Sirius is captured, Buckbeak is going to die, what are we going to do? And it's at that point that, um, it's at that point that, uh, Hermione unveils a time turner, which is a thing that she's been using to take multiple classes all at once. Um, she turns it a couple times. We go back in time. We free Buckbeak uh, while everyone else is distracted. We use Buckbeak to fly up to the cage uh, where Sirius is being kept at the top of the castle after defeating Lupin in the woods with Buckbeak. And we free Sirius, and that is the end of the story. That's it. We'll just take a second. Thank you so much for the raid. I appreciate that, Ruard. Yeah, we're doing episode one of our podcast. Appreciate that. So that's the story, in case you weren't familiar. Uh, a little bit about the development and the release. So this game was published by EA, I know, Microtransactions, and Warner Brothers. Obviously, they have the license to uh, Harry Potter and the entire Wizarding World. Um, the game was developed by a company called Gryptonite Games. It's the same developer that had done the uh, previously mentioned Harry Potter 1 and Harry Potter 2 for Game Boy Color, both games that I really liked, so I definitely want to delve into this. Now, what made this unique was that Harry Potter 1 and Harry Potter 2 for the Game Boy Color, despite numerous other editions, which we'll get into in a second, those two specific games focused on the book, Harry Potter, and not the movies. They did release concurrently with the movies, um, but they focused on the book. So they used elements that may, were in the book, but not necessarily in the movie, which is pretty cool. So I really liked that because there was some more unique details that we didn't see. Um, those those two games did pretty well, but when they got to uh, the chance to work on Prisoner of Azkaban for the Game Boy Advance, their first Game Boy Advance game that they had done on the Harry Potter franchise, they were told a couple things. They were told, one, we got to improve the graphics. Harry Potter 1 and Harry Potter 2 uh, more famously are kind of pixel based graphics, which looks really good on a handheld, in my opinion. Um, but they had they were told by um, EA or Warner Brothers or both simultaneously that they got to they have to make it a little bit more realistic looking. Um, this is kind of when pixel graphics was starting to fall out before it made its resurgence. Um, then we uh, were also told that, you know, we can't really focus on the book. We need more movie elements. So we do see in this game like direct rip from the movie quotes and the um, the portraits uh, that come up during dialogue are very clearly based off of the the actors in the movies, whereas then the first two they were like they were like illustrations of what you would think the characters look like. They weren't based off of the actors or anything at all. There is also a couple voice lines here and there. It's mostly just like when you get hit, it's like a Hoo! and things like that. Um, so they do technically have voice actors, but they don't say anything. All the dialogue is written. Um, it's more like just sound effects um, and things like that. So that is different. Um, I had uh, alluded to before as well that there are multiple versions of this game and there are multiple before that it was even more complicated. So with Harry Potter one and two, 
there is five different versions of the video game five so they had a game boy color version they had a game boy advanced version of each of those games which are different between the two completely different different developers then they had uh a playstation one and pc version different each different so and then there was a uh, redevelopment of like playstation 2 xbox gamecube that was also different so you got game boy color game boy advance pc playstation one ps2 xbox gamecube five different versions now this one they simplify it slightly of you know a little bit there's three different versions of prisoner azkaban of, of games that you can play and they're all different so there's this version i played the game boy advance version There is the PS2, Xbox, GameCube version, um, and there is the PC version. They're all very different. Um, I haven't played the PC version in a long time. I believe it's more puzzle-based, and PS2, Xbox, GameCube is like puzzles mixed with a little bit more story, something like that. So it's it's a bit different. Um, And obviously, this game was released uh, June 2nd, 2004 in North America. Released, I believe, a little bit earlier in uh, the EU, but June 2nd, 2004 in North America. So let's talk a little bit about the actual gameplay, right? So the, as I mentioned before, this is an RPG, a role-playing game, a little bit different than Harry Potter games that you might have grown up with if you didn't play them on handheld handheld games. And more specifically, it is a turn-based RPG. So if you're familiar, think Pokemon or Final Fantasy, games that when you fight or do combat, you have a turn, your enemy has a turn. You go, you guys go back and forth until there's somebody who's defeated, right? So it's a turn-based uh, role-playing game. Um, in this game, we get to uh, run with Harry, obviously, in the you know the aforementioned in the video game uh, and story. Uh, but we also get Ron and Hermione, and sometimes we have one but not the other. Sometimes we have both in our party. Um, they each have uh, they each level up as they gain experience. Leveling up gives you uh, an increase in skills. So the uh, there's quite a few different skills which are stamina and magic which is your health and magic basically then um you have defense agility and magic defense the difference between defense and magic defense defense is like your physical attack something that slashes you so it helps protect against that your magic defense um is if your spells are in magical effects is being cast on you your ability to defend those agility is just how fast you are basically determines the turn order um in the game but we uh we also see with harry ron and hermione they each have different special skills right so hermione kind of in a contradicting way if i'm being honest her ability is to lecture right uh which i guess is in line with hermione but also felt a little like yeah like like we get it she's the smart one all right we we understand um but her lecture she has three different lectures at least that we i saw during the during my playthrough and they each have different skills uh she can lecture somebody to give them uh more damage dealt with their spells she can lecture somebody to give them better defense um and i forget what the third one is i mostly just use the defense and the attack one maybe i think speed i don't remember but there there's three main ones but i mainly use attack and defense um ron's ability is like it doesn't have a specific name, but it's like it, he like throws stuff <laughs> like he throws a stink pellet. He throws a wizard cracker and they each like any kind of thing that he throws has like a specific effect. Wizard cracker just does straight damage. Uh, he also throws a stink pellet at once, which does like a tiny bit of damage, but also stuns them for a turn. That's kind of his that's kind of his deal. Very basic. Um, Harry is, is a little bit more special. So he uses card combos as a special ability. During the uh, entirety of the game, you will be finding treasure chests, hidden things that have all these different uh, witches and wizards cards. Um, And if you collect three cards that make a card combo, you can utilize that card combo as a special effect during battle. This might heal you. This might replenish your magic. It might do damage. It might do damage on all of your enemies. It might increase your defense. There's all kinds of card combos. And you can even pick up card combos in uh, in the overworld as well. But you do have a nice list of them to start out with. So you don't really have to add too much. You get the you get all the best ones uh, by default, really. Um, So you have all those. So he um, as long as you have the cards. So that's the trick. If you don't have the cards, then you can't do the card combo. So you have to collect cards. You can also buy cards from uh, Fred and George uh, who have a shop in the castle. Uh, They sell potions, they sell equipment, which we'll get into here in a second. And they also sell uh, chocolate frog cards and things like that. 
uh, so you can get a bunch from them. Um, the game also has uh, several mini games, actually, um, which. So e each of these three editions that I've played, Harry Potter one, two and three now, uh, they all have mini games and all to a varying degree are kind of pointless. Uh, Harry, Harry Potter one though the games aren't super fun they're story related so it makes sense like uh for example in harry potter one if you're familiar with the story we have to chase draco down on the broom to get neville's remember all we have to um uh we have to do a potion based mini game that's like mastermind because uh snape has a potion you have to figure out which potion to drink in order to get through the fire to go fight voldemort Harry Potter 2 goes off the rails with the mini games a little bit. Uh, we go to Nick's death day party in that one. We bowl using skulls and uh, bones. Uh, obviously that doesn't happen, so it goes off the rails a little bit. And this one is kind of like a mix of the two. So there are mini games that are important, that are relevant to the story that's going on, but what you're doing in the game doesn't exactly line up with what would happen in the story. So for example, we have there are a couple instances i believe of a flying mini game with buckbeak obviously we fly on buckbeak in the story um to get to various places um but during the game we're also like going through rings and trying to build up a score basically um there's also a mini game in here where you have to fend off to dementors the dementors they're everywhere um and you're you would you know you're kind of i guess doing an expecto patronum but you don't see like your patronus like flying around basically there's like one dementor on each side of you so above you below you and then on each side and basically as one starts walking there you just have to cast a spell to fight them back and you just have to keep it going for as long as you can um in earlier versions you cannot skip these mini games you have to get through them um, and this one, which I actually like because, again, the mini games didn't serve a real purpose for me. You can just press start and then go to end game and you can just skip the mini game altogether, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so if you you can't be bothered by the mini game or if you're like me, you try to beat games as fast as you possibly can. Uh, you can just skip through those. Um, but I would suggest giving them a try once just to see like what they're like. You know, they're kind of like they give me mobile game vibes, like things that are meant to like keep you busy um, and you like build up a high score. But they don't really, you know. They don't have a purpose beyond that so um but they're, they're somewhat interesting um as i mentioned before we got the cards that we can collect we can also collect potions that heal you replenish your magic even relieve status effects like paralysis and poison you can get potions and stuff like that um and each enemy that you fight in the game as well has specific vulnerabilities to spells that um you cast and it might be kind of frustrating as we get as i'm about to delve into the all the spells that we can get as well figuring out which spells work best against which enemies so the game includes something called informus as well so informus is uh i guess it's a spell it kind of look it's like a spell combined with a book it's kind of weird it's like i guess hermione would really love that um but uh, basically you would use the informus ability or cast the informus spell on an enemy and then you will learn his vulnerabilities and you only have to do that once per enemy so say there's a giant rat um you cast it on the giant rat then you'll always know the vulnerabilities of the giant rat by checking your book uh, and you can check your book as like a free action uh, in your turn you don't have to like spend your whole turn trying to find out what their uh, weaknesses are and stuff like that so that's pretty useful um, if you're you know at a particular point that's stuck the downside to that is that you can't really use that on bigger like boss enemies so you you know things like key moments like the werewolf or uh, when you fight you we've also fight the whomping willow to get by it uh, those are particularly challenging fights and uh, we can't figure out their weaknesses but the good side of that is that it's normally common sense for example with a willow is a tree lighted on fire works pretty well um, or use a, a Harry has specifically has a spell that's like a uh, slashing spell, which works pretty well too. So it, at least it makes most of the time it makes sense with common sense. So if you don't want to waste the turn uh, doing informus, you don't have to. Um, as before, I mentioned there are stats, you know, the stamina, the magic, defense, agility, and magic defense. Um, equipment that you can get will play into how that affects your stats so you can get equipment it's just basic like you can get robes and hats and gloves belts boots uh, they even have one in this game called charms which is just like a it's like a, a little bonus object um, you don't unfortunately when you equipped the, all this stuff there's a lot of different ones but it doesn't change your appearance 
Um, I kind of would. It would have been funny to kind of see a different appearance because there's like Quidditch gear versus uh, like wizardy robes gear versus like, you know, different things. It would have been kind of cool to see their appearance change. But it does affect your abilities. So some a lot of times there's a give and take. It's not just like, a, oh, it just drastically improves one skill. A lot of times it'll be like, this will improve your defense, but your agility will drop, things like that, which makes sense. If you put on, if you had like, think like suit of armor that you put on, like for, you know, classic suit of armor that you can imagine. If you put that on, you're going to be really well defended, but try running in that ain't going to work well. So that makes sense. Um, so you you can uh, you can get that from drops at some points, mainly from like larger enemies or boss type enemies will give you like um, equipment drops, uh, but you can also buy them from Fred and George as well. Um, and then there's the spells, right? There's a bunch of spells. I'm just going to I'm going to name off all the spells like a rap. Ready? Flipendo, Verdamilius, Incendio, Petrificus, Totalus, Wingardium, Leviosa, Lumos, Defendo, Glacius, Reparo, Spongify, Alahamora, Fumos. That's pretty good. Um, I think that was in Hamilton. Uh, but how the spells work, you, each a lot, each of the three of them have most of those spells, but each uh, between Harry, Ron, and Hermione have uh, different spells that only that particular uh, individual could use. So, for example, only Harry can use Lumos and Defendo. Uh, Lumos is obviously a spell that lights your way. Defendo is that slashing spell that I mentioned earlier. Only Hermione can use Glacius, Reparo, Fumos. Glacius freezes water. Reparo repairs things. Fumos makes it so you're harder to hit. Um, Ron only gets Spongify and Halamora. Uh, Spongify. Um, in battle, it makes it so the enemy hits you for less damage. But there's also like this in-game mechanic that has like these bouncy pads, for lack of a better term. So Ron would cast the spell on the pad, which makes it so you can jump to some kind of area. And then Alahomora, obviously, it unlocks doors and stuff. Um, the spells have their own leveling system. So if you cast a spell a certain amount of times, you will unlock a level 2 version and then eventually a level 3 version of that spell that costs way more magic, but does more damage as well. Um, some There's a few spells that don't have a level 3, they just have a level 2. Um, but I believe every spell at least levels up once, and most of them level up twice. All right, time for our next segment, which is called Buffs and Nerfs. Uh, during this segment, this is going to be just a standard what works, buffs, and what doesn't, nerfs. Um, things in the game that I really liked that I thought worked well, or in things that didn't work so well. So buffs and nerfs. Buffs, what works in this game for me? Um, obviously, this, all this is going to be very subjective as well. Some of, it, some of it is objective, things that I think, um, you know, it's very clear that this worked and this didn't. Some of it is subjective based off of my interest. But things, uh, buffs for me for this game. Um, I really love turn-based format in, uh, in games. Um, a lot of people don't like that. It's a little slow for them. Uh, they'd rather have an action game where, you know, you kind of just duke it out and, and figure it out. But I really like the strategy that goes behind uh, turn-based combat. So I'm, I was really into that. Um, and in this game, uh, in, especially in comparison to other games, uh, this game does a nice job of speeding it up a little bit. Um, in the previous games, there's a lot of time between turns and it can take up so much time, but these, uh, they really quickened up the animations, um, and made it so combat moves a little bit faster just while still keeping the turn-based element, which I really like. Um, I was also a big fan of the unique abilities for the different characters. Um, that is, uh, there's the previous game so first let's start here let's start here harry potter one you only play as harry you don't get um you don't get any help from your friends in for the game boy color version harry potter 2 you get help from ron and hermione and they do have some like special abilities but they're not super useful and they also level up so like it, it would require a lot of grinding to get to the really useful ones so i barely ever use them they're not they're not super important but this one had a lot of really good abilities that you can use right away pretty quickly into the game. Uh, so I ended up using those a lot and I actually I enjoyed that and I enjoyed how they made them more useful um, in this game as well. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of RPGs. So I love the equipment, the leveling, the spells, all of that stuff. I mean, I love RPGs. 
Um, so I, that's why I play these, these specific Harry Potter games, because I really like that they turn them into RPGs where the other games don't have that as much. So big fan of that. I wish they made the whole series that way, but alas, they didn't. Um, the spell mechanics in the overworld to solve puzzles. That is also new to this game as in comparison to one and two for the Game Boy Color. In one and two for the Game Boy Color, you couldn't even cast spells in the overworld. You can only cast spells when you're in combat. Um, so this one introduces a new element like puzzles, mazes, and things like that where you have to cast spells. And not only do they add that element, we have it adds specific specificity to it. That's a tough one. Specificity to it that only, some puzzles can only be solved with certain spells. So you have to swap back and forth uh, to use the, you know, maybe there's a, a, a lake in your way, but only Hermione can cast a spell that will freeze water so you can walk across it. Things like that. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and like the predecessors before it, the score and soundtrack uh, to this game, very good. Um, the composer uh, wrote a really, between one and two, there's a big gap in the level of music quality. Um, and then between two and three, they keep that same quality uh, while adding some new stuff. So I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, the music was very, very good. Highly recommend it. Nerfs, things that didn't go so well for me that I didn't love. Um, this is kind of a complaint with all of the, the Harry Potter RPG games, and they never really got to find a good balance of it, but it's almost entirely necessary to grind at some point uh, to level up if you're playing it casually. Obviously, if you're speedrunning it, there are strategies that you use that you don't have to grind because that would be slow. But if you're just a regular person playing this game, there you're, you're going to have to grind in order to get by... Um, difficult enemies and bosses and stuff like that which just really slows it down you're, you're on a roll with the story things are moving somewhat quickly and then you just have to sit and grind for an hour on little enemies until you level up to a high enough level to be able to withstand attacks from bigger bosses so uh, i don't love that personally not for me but uh i think that could be easily eliminated with more side quests now a disclaimer here is that there could be side quests in this game. I'm not entirely sure there could be side quests, but even if there are side quests, they're not put at the forefront. They're not super accessible. So um, if there are side quests, put them in the forefront and make a big exclamation point over their head. You know, world of world, blah, blah, blah. put a big exclamation point over their head. World of Warcraft style. So I can see that very clearly and make them in areas that I visit often. Things like that. Obviously make some that I might have to locate and are a little bit more secretive. But I think that would be a, a more clever way to level up uh, instead of grinding on enemies uh, because that'd be fun. Um, there's some <laughs> the so that. The animation style, as I mentioned before, they went from an 8-bit to a more, not realistic, but a, a more higher quality graphic here. Um, and evidently as well, that was told to them during the production of the game. So they had an idea to stick with the, um, the pixel-based graphics, and then they were told to change it. And that kind, of, that kind of plays out in the animations somewhat. So they have... Most of it is just overhead, so you're kind of looking uh, over the head of your the characters that are walking around. But then sometimes it weirdly switches to like an isometric, um, like walking upstairs. Then it becomes very difficult to control, especially with a handheld system that just has a D-pad. It becomes very awkward with the animations, and then you you're, you end up walking downstairs. You're trying to walk up and. Uh, when you're in battle, it has like a turning background compared with a stationary floor, and it just looks awkward. It's not it's not great. So um, not as much of a fan of that. But again, I think that was a product of them being rushed into this. So that makes sense to me, um, but not as much of a fan. Um, this one was a big one for me. So um, I mentioned before that sp that spells level up um, in intensity and magic costs, which I actually think is really cool. However, the downside to that is there's little incentive to use the higher level spells because the damage from the higher level spells does not scale with the amount of magic increased uh, that, that it costs. For example, Incendio, which is a fire spell, costs six magic points to use Now, when you, uh, for level one. If you tr cast that level two, I believe it's 15 or 20, and the damage doubles. So that's great, damage doubles, sure, but like, why wouldn't I just cast, I, I know it would take two turns, but I'd rather cast Incendio 
twice to get the damage dumbbell and then i just saved myself eight magic points right so if they were going to level up like that i would have liked to see them level up in scale uh with the amount of magic that was used because i found myself not wanting to use them very often the only time i would use higher level spells really is if i needed to go big or go home and i was trying to end a battle um and things like that because i didn't want to use all my magic points so it was kind of a little frustrating in that regard um also and this one is probably even a bigger complaint and uh, and this this actually caused me a problem in the game that i was worried that i wouldn't be able to finish it uh which was that it's very easy to get locked into a story moment without the ability to go out and purchase more equipment or uh potions and things like that uh for example the end of the game uh the last fight you fight is draco who's kind of like looking over uh and watching over like where Sirius is locked up. And he's the last fight of the game. At that point, I had fought the Whomping Willow, a big ass troll, um, Lupin in werewolf form. I, I was spent. I had no potions left. I had no cards, things like that. But once you enter the area, the rooftop area, even if you died, so even if I went up to Draco, I fought him and I died, it just starts me back at that area. So. Like I was worried that I could easily get very easily get stuck into a loop where I can't defeat Draco, I can't go get equipment to beat Draco, um, and I can't get spells to keep me alive. Luckily, I with clever usage, I was able to balance it out. But um, I would like for them to either not lock us into that, or if you're going to lock us into a story moment, I'd rather suspend disbelief for a second and then just have like a little shop there there or something, right? So like, yes, we're about to fight Draco, but maybe friend George is like, hey, before you fight Draco, why don't you come buy some potions or something like that? I'd rather have that because I'd rather be able to be successful, you know, um, then get, then get stuck. So I think sometime, I bet, I, I would heavily imagine that people would get stuck very easily and then they would be they wouldn't know what to do um so i i definitely would have liked to see that next segment is called how many carts how many carts so we're gonna have our final impressions and review uh for every game that we play um and it's going to be based out of five cartridges cartridges let me pull one out for you uh this is obviously not going to transfer onto the podcast version but a cartridge if you're not familiar is what the games look like so for example i have a pokemon red cartridge here um it's just a, you know like a little box thing so that's going to be kind of our our rating system out of five cartridges so first let me get my final impressions of the game the rpg mechanics do an excellent job of telling the story of prisoner of azkaban i think it's a really unique way of telling the story and it lends nicely to the story that was already created and utilizing the different characters both in battle and out of the battle makes for very entertaining gameplay very crisp moving and makes it so uh, you feel like you're moving at a great pace however the game is hampered somewhat by the need to grind and the potential to get locked into story elements without the ability to do anything about it and it's could easily be resolved by easier to access side quests, um, more shops, or the ability to get out of these story moments somehow. Um, and the animations were finicky at points. Uh, but nonetheless, RPGs proved to be the better versions of these Harry Potter games, and I still prefer playing them over any other version. So I'm going to give this game three and a half carts. Three and a half carts. Right now would be a good graphic to have on the screen, but again, does not translate to a podcast version, but three and a half carts is what we're going with. All right, and finally, we're going to do our last segment, which is called Game Over Continue. Uh, Next episode, which is going to be roughly two weeks from now, uh, we're going to be talking about a video game called Super Mario Brothers Deluxe for the Game Boy Color, a game that I just had the quote unquote pleasure of playing on stream. I'm still going to try and beat it before then. I almost beat it in one sitting, but the uh, the last worlds were giving me a little bit of trouble. Um, we're going to be discussing that in, uh, uh, you know, who doesn't love talking about a good old fashioned Mario game. 
Um, so that'll be, a, like I said, roughly two weeks from now. Um, please follow me on Twitter. My Twitter is at conception underscore two. Uh, also follow and or subscribe on Twitch. My Twitch is twitch.tv slash conception two. You can also find me on YouTube if you search Nate Porteous. Porteous is P-O-R-T-E-O-U-S. Um, obviously, your uh, the podcast will be available on things like Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Um, we're going to look into other platforms as well, maybe Google Play, um, things like that. Um, but if you prefer to see a video version, which is going to be more of a uh, a raw version without the you know sound effects and a little less edits, uh, you can check it out on Twitch, and you can also check it out on YouTube. I'll have uh, video versions as well. Also, if you're listening to the podcast version, I would really, really appreciate to help get the podcast off the ground. If you would uh, rate and review the podcast on wherever you're listening to it on uh, rate it five stars, if you like it, um, I would hope that you do. Um, but if you could just give us a review, just give us some attention so we can kind of get it off the ground a little bit more. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and just finally, thanks for listening and watching. This is the uh, first official episode, so I couldn't be more excited to uh, keep going on with this. And I hope that uh, you'll join us in two weeks for our episode on Super Mario Brothers Deluxe. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.